begin a, a new uh, sermon series, which I'm calling uh, our prescription for physical fitness. And, and we're, I, I know from my conversations with some of you that some of you are scared to death about this talk, about these series of talks. I've, I've had uh, some of you say, Pastor Mark, you know, you and Mary Kay have been uh, kind of working out and exercising this year, and now you're just going to beat up on us. You lost your weight, and now you want us to lose our weight. Now, I just want you to know nothing could be further from the truth. I have spent a lot of time this year thinking about what the Bible has to say to me about my body, and I want to share with you some of those things uh, from a biblical perspective. I want us to look at our physical health, because God in His Word, you know, He gives us instructions for a lot of different things. And over the years, we have had special topical sermon series about how we handle our money, how we handle our relationships, how we handle and, and raise our children, right? And we've talked about a lot of these special things that the Bible talks about. Well, the Bible also has a lot to tell us about our physical health. And the truth is, so that you know that I'm not going to be beating up on you, you already know what to do. This is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. You know, to get more healthy for most of us, we've got to be eating healthy. Some of us have got to be eating less. You've got to get moving. You've got to lower the stress. You've got to get more rest in your life. I mean, this is not rocket science. And you know this. And there's nothing that I can teach you either today or the next six weeks to tell you what you already know. What I do want to do today is to focus on motivation, to focus on the why. How many times have you, at the beginning of the year especially, right after New Year's, set up a resolution to get in shape, and a month later, it's all out the window? If you don't have the right motivation, you're not going to stick with it. You're, you've got to have the right reason. You've got to figure out the why in your life. And God will ultimately, if you figure out the why, God's going to show you the how. Will you trust me on that? So I want us to look at what God says today about the importance of the body. And we're going to look at six reasons about why the body is important and give you that motivation, that body motivation. And our scripture today is going to come from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, verses 12 through 20. So I want you to open up your Bible. I'm going to go ahead and do that for myself, whether you've got the Bible on the pew rack in front of you or whether you have uh, one of those electronic Bibles. If you have the version Bible, we've got the Bible uh, notes in there and, and all of that. But I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to be reading today out of the, out of the uh, NIV, the New International Version. And then we'll go through and see what this has to say. Now, as we prepare, as we look at this, I'm going to teach you something about studying the Bible. You know, it's possible there are times when the Bible teaches more than one thing at the same time. There is a very apparent primary teaching that we're going to be looking at. It's uh, one of the reasons why we have invited our children to go downstairs today because there is a sexual immorality issue that Paul is talking to the Corinthians about. But there's also a secondary teaching, and today we're going to focus mostly on that secondary teaching, what the Bible has to tell us about our bodies. So let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 12, and we'll read down to verse 20. This is Paul talking, Paul writing, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. But I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. And he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in the body? For it is said that two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? 
who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Okay, so there we have 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. And like I say, the primary teaching that Paul has there is to flee from sexual immorality. So for those of you who are involved in sexual immorality today, let's apply the primary teaching. Stop it. Okay? I mean, do we need to say any more? I think that pretty well covers it. I think Paul pretty well covers it. But in his arguments about this, he teaches us the biblical teaching that we need to know about our bodies. And in here we find six reasons why we should be motivated to take the very best care of our bodies that we possibly can. So let me quickly go through those. Reason number one, the why number one is this. God expects me to manage my body. God expects me to manage my body. Verse 12 and 13, let me read that again. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but, and here I've underlined it for you, I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach, and the stomach for food, God will destroy them both. You know, some things in life are not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. Chocolate donuts, it's back there on the table today. They're not necessarily wrong, they're just not necessary, right? You are free to do whatever you want, but not everything that you and I want to do is necessarily beneficial. You don't want to be mastered by anything. You don't want anything to dominate you. Food is one thing that's being talked about here, but there's all kinds of things in the physical life that you don't want to be dominated by. Food in our bodies, here that we have, version 1.0, not going to last forever. This is not why we are here. Here is the principle, number one principle, that you've got to get for the rest of these six weeks, and this will be the difference between you understanding the real motivation for you wanting to take care of your body and not having the right motivation. And here's the principle, I am not the owner. You are not the owner. This body that we have, I am not the owner. I am the manager. I am the steward. God, very clearly in this statement, God, in, in the Bible, very clearly states that God is the owner of my body. So today, what we're talking about is the stewardship of our health. Now, not every one of us have the choice to be as healthy as we would like to be. But I'll bet you that most of us could make certain decisions within our life whereby we could be healthier, right? Not everything is within our control, but we have the ability through good stewardship to take good care of our health. And you and I, neither one of us, can blame other people for how I and you misuse or abuse our body. I am the manager of this body. You are the manager of the body that God has given you. We need to recognize that our bodies are gifts from God. They are on loan to us. They do not belong to us. One day, I and you, all of us, each of us, will need to give an accounting for how we have taken care of this gift that God has given us. What did I do with the health that God has given me? What have I done with the opportunities to improve my health that God has given me? What have I done with the opportunities for my mind? What have I done with the abilities that God has given me? What have I done with the wealth that God has given me? All of these things are things of which we are stewards that are temporary and are only here for a period of time. In the meantime, we have a responsibility to manage them as best we can. So that's our very first point, and it's very crucial that you get that, that God expects you and I to manage our body. There's a second thing we learn here, and that is that my God, my body is God's property. My body, your body, is God's property. It's very close to the first point. We're not the owner. But let me read this to you, the back part of verse 13. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but what? For the Lord, and the Lord for the body. See, everything around you, including this body that you have, was created 
by God. The Creator owns it all. You and I, it may feel like it, but we don't own anything. We, we leave it all behind, right? I mean, we get to the end of life and nothing goes with us. The Creator owns it all. We use it while we're here. But I don't have the right, nor do you have the right to do anything you want to with your body. You can't, for example, as it says here, I can't take my body and just share it with anyone. Because God gives me very specific instructions. You know, we make oftentimes the same mistakes that the original Greeks made. They had this concept of duality. They had this idea that they had they were a soul or a spirit. There was a realness to who they were. And then there was the body, which was completely separate and apart. And you know, they so long as they could divorce themselves in terms of the real them from the body that was them, then anything they did with the body, anything they did with their physicalness was okay because that wasn't really them. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says that my spirit must be right with God and my body must be right with God. It doesn't matter whether I want to think differently in my mind or not. God looks at how I use my body. The Bible teaches this duality as false. Our bodies are holy because God made our bodies. And so anything that God makes is good and not evil. God has made me, he has made you for a purpose, and he expects us to manage our bodies so that we can fulfill that purpose. And that requires us to take good care of it. Right? So we've learned that God expects me to manage my body because my body is God's property, not my own. And then we learned something else that's uh, really fascinating here, and I hope will be very helpful to many of you, and that is number three, that my body and your body will be resurrected someday. This is a real motivating factor for us to take good care of our physical health because our bodies are going to be resurrected. What does it say in verse 14? By his power, we'll get back to that in a moment because that's very important. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. I want you to know that right now you and I are living with what I want to call version 1.0 of our bodies. You got version 1.0. In heaven, every one of us get an upgrade. In heaven, we get version 2.0. Okay? And if you think that when you die, that you're going to be some amorphous spirit just kind of floating around the world, I want you to know that's wrong. The, body, the Bible teaches us that we have physical bodies in heaven. That we are going to be resurrected. How was Jesus resurrected? Jesus was resurrected bodily. And it says that we're going to be resurrected just like he was. They touched him. He had a physicalness to him that we will also have. Sometimes I hear people saying, well, you know, when someone dies, we become an angel. No, that's wrong. Angels are angels. People are people. They're two different things. We don't become angels when we die. Now, some people have this concept of heaven about white robes and wings and playing a harp, harp and floating on clouds. I want you to know, as far as I'm concerned, that sounds more like hell than heaven to me. <laughs> God created color. God created taste buds. God created beauty. And he wants us to be able to enjoy all of that. And we need physical bodies to be able to do that. Now, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. I mean, we read about Jesus being resurrected, and, and we read here that we're going to be like Jesus. I don't know exactly how that's going to be. I do know that somehow Jesus was able to kind of appear and disappear. He was able to kind of walk through walls, and yet he was physical. So I don't know, maybe, you know, version 2.0 has some kind of transporter being for us, you know, kind of the Star Trek. Thing. I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but I do know this. We are going to have bodies. And I know that there's not going to be any blemishes. Some of us I know right now struggle with our health. No matter what we do, we can only get to a certain level of health. But version 2.0 and all that's gone. Right? We have the perfect health. No blemishes. Perfect in every way. Now, this first uh, phrase in this verse, verse 14, by his power. I want you to circle that. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. Because I think this leads us to three different mistakes 
that we make when we try to improve our health and we do it for the wrong reason. The first mistake, and all of us have made this, so I'm not preaching against any one person, I've made this myself a lot. The first mistake we make is we rely on our own willpower. We try to rely on our own willpower instead of upon God's power. Willpower will work for about three weeks. <laughs> and then we get tired and we give up. We go, you know, we go on a diet, three weeks later we're off the diet. We stop smoking, and then three weeks later, we're smoking again. Willpower by itself is not enough to change. We let go of the steering wheel eventually, and autopilot just kind of kicks back in, and we go back to the direction of what we were used to. Willpower by itself is exhausting. We need not our willpower. We need God's power, right? So it's by His power. The second mistake that we often make when we try to improve our health is we have the wrong motivation. That's kind of why we're talking about this today. We're doing what we're doing, but we're doing it for the wrong reason. If our goal is about us, that's not enough. If I want to lose weight or get healthier because I want to fit into certain clothes or I want to look a certain way, I want to look good, I want to feel good, you know, those are all worthy goals. I'm not putting any of them down, but they're not the right motivation that's going to give us the strength to be able to stay with this. We're talking today about something that is far deeper. We're talking about something with much greater spiritual significance. There's a spiritual significance for why we want to do what we want to do when it comes to our bodies. So we make a mistake by trying to rely on our own willpower. We make a mistake by having the wrong motivation. And then thirdly, we try to change on our own. We try to do it on our own. You know, the fact, the truth is, all of us were made for community. We've got to have group support. We've got to have a partner. We've got to have a coach. We've got to have accountability. And we cannot do it on our own. That leads us actually to the fourth wrong motivation and that we have to learn today. And that is this, that my body is connected. My body, your body, our physical bodies are connected to the body of Christ. To the body of Christ. Let me read verse 15 and then skip down to 18. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, as I said at the very beginning, there is a primary teaching here, and if you're sinning sexually, stop doing that. There is a secondary teaching here, though, that helps us to understand why that is so wrong, and any other way that we mistreat our body is also wrong because we do not belong to ourselves. There are implications of our actions that go beyond us. And that's true of everything that we do physically, not just sexually. It's true of how we eat. It's true of how we move. It's true of the attitude that we have to our bodies. We are connected to Christ, and we're connected physically to one another. You know, anybody who's ever been a parent ultimately understands this, right? Your actions and your kids' actions, for better or for worse, affect the whole family, right? Not just ourselves. And Paul here is teaching us specifically that sexual immorality is a sin against one's own body. So there is a physical sin against our, our body, which is also a sin against the body of Christ. For better or for worse, the two are connected. It's not like, well, there's this physical me and there's this spiritual me, and the physical me doesn't affect the spiritual me. And we, there's also a connection between the physical me and the physical you. If I sin somehow, physically, I'm going to affect you as well, and you likewise to me. For better or for worse, we're connected. Individually, we're connected to our bodies. There is no separation between our bodies and our soul. And we are connected to one another in the body of Christ. Which is why you and I, more than anybody else, should be motivated to encourage and to help out one another. Logically, if I help others in the body of Christ, I am helping myself. 
And if I'm helping myself be more physical, healthy, I'm helping others in the body of Christ. My body is connected to the body of Christ. Your body is connected to the body of Christ. And then fifthly, the fifth motivation for us, and if nothing else, man, this should just grab a hold of us. The Holy Spirit lives in my body. The Holy Spirit lives in your body. Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are, here's the word, temples of the Holy Spirit? Of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. As amazing as this is, God takes his spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and takes his spirit and puts it inside of my body and puts it inside of your body. That means that God, Spirit, Himself, takes up residency inside of you and inside of me. He puts His Spirit in my spirit. He puts His Spirit inside of your spirit. And for that reason, I and you, to find here, are the temple of God. I mean, I want you to think about this history of the church and history of the Bible. Early on in the Bible, we read the first five chapters, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, right? We read on, and what we find is, is early Israelites, they, they had a tabernacle that they took with them, and God resided in that tabernacle. And then ultimately, they got to the place where they were going to stay, and God gives instructions to Solomon on how his temple will be built, and there are multiple versions of that temple. But when Jesus came and Jesus died and Jesus rose again, God's Spirit moved from the tabernacle and from the temple to you, Christ follower. You become that tabernacle. As, as my brother Todd was talking about, the tent that we have, right? God's Spirit moves inside this tabernacle, this tent. This body becomes the temple of God. Now, I want to ask If you're walking down the street, and you saw some people who were vandalizing this physical building. They were spray painting it, they were throwing rocks, they were breaking windows, they were damaging this physical church. What would you do? I think at the very least you'd call 911, right? You'd be calling the police, you'd tell them to stop. Wait a minute, that's my church, don't do that. Well, here's the thing. This church is just a physical structure. The Bible teaches us that our bodies are the temple of God. And yet some of us vandalize our bodies and never think twice about it. Has nothing at all to do with whether I care whether I've had enough rest or not. Has nothing to do with whether I think I'm too heavy or not. Has nothing to do with what I think my blood pressure should be or not. Has no idea. It has nothing to do with what the BMI is supposed to be. It has everything to do with I want this temple to be the best temple it could possibly be for God's Spirit which resides within me. Now that's motivation. That's motivation. And if that weren't enough, reason number six. Jesus bought my body. Jesus bought your body on the cross. Verse 20 tells us this. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Boy, could it be any more clear. Do you know how much you're worth? If you stop to think about it, some of us have a real problem understanding what our self-worth really is. And the very last talk that we're going to be giving the very first Sunday in December will be about our identity in Christ. You need to have that down pat. That's why all of these talks are so important for you. But just to give you a very brief preview of that, you need to know how much you're worth. Do you know that with arms outstretched and with nail-pierced hands, Jesus said, this is how much I love you. I love you so much, I'd rather die than to live without you. That's how valuable you are to God. Your body is priceless. Now, let me just ask you another quick question. Let me 
ask you, if you happen to be so lucky that you own a million dollar racehorse, would you feed that million dollar racehorse junk food? You'd be crazy to do that, right? But we put that stuff in our bodies all the time. And we aren't worth a million dollars. The Bible says that you and I are priceless. You're worth more to God than the million dollar racehorse. You are a temple of God. One verse I want to take you away from 1 Corinthians, just to give you some idea that this is not just one little place, one little thing. You know, sometimes it helps us to get a vision of what the Bible says in other places. So I want to take you to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Some of us have memorized this verse. For some of us, this is a, a priority verse for us. But there might be a phrase in here that you have never noticed before. Let me read it to you. Romans 12, 1 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, here it comes, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, I don't know about you, but when I take that and I look at it very literally, I am surprised. Because it doesn't offer, it doesn't say that you and I offer our souls as a living sacrifice. It says offer your bodies. You can't serve God in any other way other than in your body. Have <laughs> you ever heard sometimes people say, hey brother, I'm there with you in spirit. No, you're not. There's only one way that I can be there with you. You know what that means? That when somebody says, I'll be there with you in spirit, it means nothing. Because you can't be somewhere where you aren't. You can only be where you are physically, in your body. And taking care of your health is actually, according to this, an act of worship. Many of us have never thought about it that way. We've thought about the things that we should do to take care of our bodies as something that either is or isn't a priority to us personally. And so there are some people for whom that is a big deal, and we expect them to, you know, kind of major in that, but it's not a big deal to us. But it doesn't matter whether it's a big deal to us or not, because what we find here is, is that when we take care of our bodies, it's not about us, it's about God. It's actually another form of worship. It's every bit as much of worship when I choose or don't choose to do something that's good for me physically, as it is for Cindy to be singing that great song that she's hanging up here today. It's all worship. Now, let me summarize. As your pastor, who loves you, right? I want you to know that. I love you. I want you to get your bodies in better health. To the extent that it's possible for you, I want you to do that. Not just so that you can look good, not just so that you can feel good. Not just so that you can live longer. Those are all good motivations. But because of these six things that we've been talking about today, that God created my body, that Jesus died for my body, that God's Spirit lives inside of my body, that I'm connected to Christ's body and to one another, that God is going to resurrect my body someday, and that I'm expected to manage. I'm expected to take care of this body. And those are all spiritual reasons to take care of a physical body. One day soon, and for some of us we can't wait, we're going to get version 2.0. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the way I take care of this body and the way you take care of your body is a spiritual discipline. Not just physical. So let's do a little bit of application here, right? There's not a person here who cannot be healthier in some way or another. Now, I, again, I understand that not all of our health is entirely in our own control. But what we do about our health, the actions that we take about our health is, and each one of us have a responsibility to do what we can do for our health. Because our bodies are not our own. So what are you doing? to improve this gift, this body that God has given to you. You see, it doesn't matter what Pastor Mark has done or what Mary Kay has done or what anybody else has done for their body one way or the other. What, what I needed to do isn't what you need to do. 
And what I need to do next year isn't the same thing I needed to do last year. Every single one of us are different. We're all in a unique place. God speaks to each one of us uniquely. So this morning, I want God to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you. What is he saying to you today? Is it possible that right now you're feeling the spirit nudging you about eating better? Well, then you should write that down. That might not be true for everybody, but it might be true for you. Is the Spirit nudging you to move more? To be a little bit more active in, in how you treat this body? Some of us, I know, struggle with the smoking issue. And, you know, is, is the Spirit saying, hey, I, I need you to take some steps to not hurt your body that way? Maybe, and I know this is one for me, you know, some of us haven't been to visit a doctor in a very long time. Maybe one of the things that we need to do is to get to see a doctor. Right? It could be that. Or, or maybe, maybe you need to read a book. Maybe, you know, learning more about how to take care of your body is important. Maybe, maybe you need to join an accountability group. Maybe there's some kind of a health group, healthy group, a diet group, or a physical fitness group that you could be a part of. Maybe right now the Spirit could be nudging some of you to dance more. You know, it doesn't all have to be hard things here, right? Seriously, it doesn't have to be hard, difficult things. In fact, God has designed our bodies to be enjoyed. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through this series. You know, we're going to enjoy physical bodies perfectly in heaven someday. So why not start now? You know, in John 5, John 5, you don't have to turn there, you'll remember this story. John 5, we see the story where Jesus is walking down the street and he sees this guy sitting on the side of the road who's been sick for 38 years. He's been unhealthy for 38 years. He's a, he's a paraplegic. And Jesus walks up to him and he asks one of the most important questions that I want to pose to you this morning. Because it's a question that I can't believe he asked. But the question was this. Do you want to get well? And I ask you that question this morning. Do you want to get well? That's a profound question. Because in the story, you think, of course the guy wants to get well. But Jesus asks him anyway. And I think the Holy Spirit asks us this morning, do you really want to get well? Is this series of talks just kind of in your way this morning? Or is this the opportunity that some of us have been waiting for for a long time to really understand the connection between my soul and my body? Do I want to get well? Do you want to get well? That's our question. Where do you want to be a year from now health-wise? Do you want to have the most energy? Do you want to have the sharpest mind? Do you want to have the brightest smile? Do you want to have the strongest body that you've ever had? Do you really, really want to get well? 